Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Susanna Wong, Senior Manager of the Market Outreach Division at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. On behalf of the Alliance of Green Commercial Banks, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today uh, at our training. Accelerating energy efficiency through financial structures. The Alliance is a new initiative to connect commercial banks dedicated to green financing. Financial institutions, research institutions, and innovative technology providers, with the aim of supporting such commercial banks on their journey towards becoming leading green financial institutions. The alliance was launched in November 2020 by the IFC and its first regional anchor, the HKMA, and is supported by the China World Bank Group Partnership Facility and the World Bank Group SDG Partnership Fund. We invite you to visit the Alliance website for more information and register online to receive regular updates about the Alliance activities, including its upcoming events. In this session, we're very honored to have with us our special guest speaker, Mr. Marshall Salon, Global Head of Cities Clean Energy Finance Group, to share with us how financial structures can help accelerate energy efficiency. Mr. Salon has broad experience in providing full surface financing solutions to cities' clean energy clients and is active in wind, solar, and geothermal power projects, as well as fuel cells, biomass, syn fuels, and other new renewable energy technologies and energy efficiency financings. I'm sure we're all looking forward to Marshall's presentation. Marshall, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. So hopefully everybody can hear me and I'll say good afternoon to you in New York. It's about two o'clock in the morning. So I'd have to say either good night or very early good morning. Uh, with me from City is a guy named Alexander Bodie. You can't see him, but he's on. He's going to be helping me to uh, change the pages. Alex, if you want to put up the cover page. Um, so today what we want to discuss He's going to screen share. Okay. Today, what we want to discuss is, as the title says, accelerating energy efficiency, or EE, as we like to abbreviate it, through financial structures. And as it said, I'm the uh, head of our clean energy finance team. And City is very, very focused on ESG. And we're very big believers and feel it's part of our corporate responsibility to help with the clean energy transition. That's why we're doing this at 2 o'clock in the morning to show how important it is. So if you go to the first page, I think most people agree that we want to target net zero. One of the dilemmas we have is that to reach net zero, there are two fundamentally different ways that the world can reach net zero. To do this, we have to, on the left, either build new clean energy, which is even more effective if while building new clean energy, for example, wind or solar or hydro, we replace old fossil fuels, coal, coal plants, for example. So you got to build new. It's even better if you subtract fossil fuel. But the other way that we can get to net zero is to reduce energy consumption. And that's what energy efficiency is all about. How do we reduce energy consumption. And it's not just energy. It can be water and other resources. And fundamentally, when we want to talk about reducing energy consumption, we have to think about two different ways to do that. We can build energy efficiency, EE, into new construction, new projects, new buildings, new manufacturing plants, or we can upgrade the old existing projects, plants, and equipment that we already have by adding the EE upgrades to what's already built. So to express and measure this, the industry developed the term megawatt to go as basically a negative megawatt. So we say megawatt versus megawatt. Well, again, a megawatt is the unit of energy when you build new clean energy, you build a megawatt, or you could do energy efficiency upgrades and reduce energy consumption by that same one megawatt, and that's a megawatt. And we often find that in most recent years, it costs actually more to build that new megawatt of clean energy, 
let's say it costs a million dollars to build a megawatt of clean energy, but it only costs half that much, $500,000 to do an energy efficiency upgrade that would reduce the same one megawatt. So in many cases, it's been our experience that energy efficiency is actually more effective for the dollar amount spent than building new clean energy. And that shouldn't come as a surprise because one, you have to build from scratch. The other one, you already have your plant, your, your, your headquarters, your, your factory, and now you're just going to reduce the electricity from various sources. So if we go to the next page, we say, well, what do we mean more about this energy efficiency world? Who does this impact? Why is it something we should focus on? And there's a wide variety of tools that we can employ to reduce energy consumption. First, we have to decide who are the players that need to reduce energy consumption. Well, it's corporations, because again, they have industrial properties, they own, they, they have buildings, they have tenants, if it's commercial real estate, uh, it's residential housing, it's multifamily housing, but it's also universities, schools, hospitals, governments. Think of all the government buildings that could use an energy efficiency upgrade, at least in America, it's the city hall, it's the consulate, it's the courthouse, it's the embassy, it's the federal government buildings. Most of them were built a long time ago. And when you think about it, what are the buildings that you spend time in where they're too hot in the summer and they're too cold in the winter because the windows don't close properly, they were poorly insulated, they weren't built with energy usage in mind, they were built because we needed schools and classrooms or hospitals and places for patients. So all that old infrastructure that the governments have in America is a prime target for energy efficiency upgrades. But again, so is all the housing, so is all the corporate headquarters and corporate manufacturing. The bottom line is energy efficiency potentially impacts everybody. So everyone was in the target market. Now the question would then be, okay, in that target market, what do we actually mean in the real world by energy efficiency upgrades? And there are many, many examples. Unfortunately, most of them are boring. They're not sexy. They're not exciting. It's things like replacing lighting, people, things like replacing windows and insulation, your HVAC air conditioning systems or your heaters or your, uh, your motor upgrades and air compressors. Some of it gets more interesting, like rooftop solar and battery storage. But some of it could be as simple as replacing refrigerators. And, and in a home, it could be a, a washing machine or, or, a, or a clothes dryer or whatever. So, And then there's the newer generations, things like demand response and management systems uh, and combining heat and power and water management systems. But a lot of it's just boring stuff. And the bottom line is almost anything that runs on energy, if it's not brand new, it could probably be replaced with new equipment that is more energy efficient. Because almost anything that's more than a couple of years old has been improved and the new versions use less energy to run. So the problem is in that situation, the old equipment may be energy inefficient. It uses too much energy to run, but it still works. So not everybody wants to spend money to fix it or replace it because they say, I can keep it for another 10 years. Why do I need to put in a new one just to use electricity, less electricity? And again, anytime people look at specific large expenditures, if a school gets a big amount of money, they want to build a new laboratory or a new, a new building to house professors. They don't want to say that, oh, we're going to use all that money to replace the windows in the old buildings. It just doesn't resonate. It doesn't get people excited. The same way for a company a for-profit company, if they raise money, they issue a bond, they raise equity, whatever, they raise money, they want to build a new headquarters because that can show up on the front page of their annual report. They don't want to tell their shareholders, oh, well, that money we raised, we're going to use it to replace the lights in the old factory and put insulation in the walls. That's just not an interesting story. So you'd rather have the picture of your headquarter or the new plant on, or, or a picture of the new products you're producing from your new factory, as opposed to senior management at the end of the year saying, wow, it was a great year, revenue was down, but we replaced all our water pumps and now we're gonna use less energy for the next 20 years. So the dilemma, as you can see, is energy efficiency saves money over time, but it's not always a big, exciting event 
that saves lots of money in the first year. And if we go to the next page to elaborate on this, here's the specific problem that we run into all the time. Um, the dilemma is that although energy efficiency measures clearly show savings on day one, they're not big savings. So for example, here's a typical example. You're gonna spend a million dollars today to do an energy efficiency upgrade. And that's gonna produce 250,000 in electricity savings every year for the next 20 years. That's obviously a transaction that most corporations agree should, they should do because you're gonna save $5 million over 20, you're spending a million today to save 5 million, 250 over 20 years, 4 million net after your investment. That transaction is an IRR of over 25%. The NPV is positive 1.2 million, assuming even a 10% discount rate. So by most standard measures, this would be something that makes sense. However, people have to worry about their earnings and their accounting. And the problem is in year one, you only save 250 grand, but just spent a million. So the year one impact, if you expense it, is negative 750,000 in the first year because you spent more than you saved. And most corporations run into this optical and they say, all right, pencils down. It doesn't make sense. We can't do it because although it clearly makes sense over 20 years, this year, it's not going to help us. It's going to look bad, not good. So this is where financial structures can really help because financial structures can provide products to spread out that million dollars over 10 or 20 years. And if you could spread out that cost, you don't have to expense it all in the first year. Now you don't have this negative cost benefit equation. So if, for example, using one of our structures, you spread out that million dollars over the full 20 years, it, it, that would be 50,000 a year if you spread it over 20, but if we, we're gonna build in some interest costs. So it's gonna cost 60,000, 60,000 per year, every year for 20 years, instead of spending a million up front. So you've turned a million up front into 60,000 per year. But remember, you're saving 250,000 a year. Well, 250,000 a year of benefit against 60,000 per year of cost means now you're ahead by $190,000 a year. And that has a positive net earnings impact of 190. And now you can brag about, hey, we're, reach, we're doing our best for our ESG uh, objectives and we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Isn't this wonderful? And from an earnings perspective, it actually works. And whether you're a corporation or a government or even a homeowner, you have the same problem, which is summarized on the bottom. If you spend it all in year one and you expense it in year one, you get positive of 250, negative a million, you have negative 750. But on the right, you have savings positive 250, You've spread out the expense. It's only 60 negative. Now you're ahead by 190 every year for 20 years. And believe it or not, many companies, at least in the United States, when faced with this analysis, this they'll do all the time. But if you don't spread the cost out and they have to show the 750 negative, they just say, you know what? I need to spend my money on other things because it doesn't help me with earnings. It doesn't help me with accounting and it's too expensive. So moving to the next page, we have that simple concept is what we use to incentivize people to spend money on energy efficiency, spread out the costs, and finance these upgrades separately in a way that is earnings positive. And how we actually do it depends on the size of the project. This is a market where size matters. And the first, there are three different sizes that we will talk about. There are large scale projects, which are not easy, but there's a clear way that those can be done. In fact, there's many ways they can be done. At the other end of the spectrum, there are very small scale projects, like let's say in an individual homeowner's apartment or in their house, depending on where they live. So a large scale project could be 500 million or a billion, whereas a homeowner, it may only be 25,000 or 50,000. And very, very different tools you're going to use for 500 million versus 50,000 as the size of the project. So you have the big ones, you have the small ones, and then the third category is everything in the middle. So starting with the large scale energy efficiency projects, all the stakeholders and corporations have now been taught to care about ESG, 
to care about greenhouse gases. They're all focused on this. Everybody want to make everybody wants to make it work. So what are the forces that get in the way of this? Um, they know they need to leverage the majority of the ESG structures, but there's a disconnect between the internal stakeholders with combined with the reluctancy to deploy the capital slows down the rollout unless you can show them how to finance it. So in, in instances where these entities are willing to self-finance, maybe look at it and look at it and look at it and say, this the stuff I'm going to talk about is too complicated. We could just finance it ourselves. But then inevitably they find out, well, I need to use my money to build a new factory to produce my widgets. So I'm not going to use it to save energy. Again, it's a matter of limited resources have to be allocated. So for these larger projects, we have some standardized structures and whether it's a it's a government or a university or a hospital or corporations, including city, we've done it ourselves. We've developed our ESG and GHG goals. And now we have to figure out how we're going to achieve them. And some of the products that when you think about what can you do to hit your greenhouse gas or your ESG objectives. And one way to do it is to uh, think about, am I going to finance this one big project? Or maybe I can do a program of five or six medium-sized projects, but all with the same company. And again, I have limited funds at the corporate level. So should I use my money specifically for EE? And again, sometimes they analyze and they say no. Sometimes they say yes. When they say no, they say, well, is there a different way I can finance it? And the tools that we use to actually finance it for these big clients are based on the fact that they're going to achieve their ESG goals and they have a fundamental choice. They could procure, buy clean energy to achieve the environmental part of their ESG goals. Well, how do you do that? You could put solar panels on the rooftop of your project or your headquarters. You could sign a power purchase agreement or PPA or a virtual power purchase agreement. You could issue a green bond. There are leasing structures. You could do non-recourse project finance because it's a big project. You could try to take advantage of the incentives in your particular country, tax credits if they have them or tariffs or other things that they have or new structures. Um, green Are there green banks at the country level? or at the state level, there's a whole host of ways that you could buy clean energy. Or you say, okay, I'm going to do some of that, but I'm also going to look to reduce my energy consumption. And that's back to energy efficiency. And the reality is, it's not a question of A or B. It really is going to be a question of A and B, but in which proportions? Because companies that really care about this are finding they need to do both. And if you do the energy efficiency again, you could install it in your new projects, or you could go back and figure out how could I upgrade my existing projects. And now we're going to look at, again, leases. But now we have two new things, an energy performance contract and an energy as a service as an off-balance sheet way to do this. You can bring in energy services companies, ESCOs. You can do things involving on-bill financing through your local utility. In America, there's a thing called PACE which is property assessed clean energy in certain countries where they have property taxes. Again, maybe this would work. We can talk about that at some point um, or back to tax credits and new structures. But the bottom line is you could buy clean energy or for a large project, you could do the energy efficiency upgrades. Most people are going to do both. And if you do the energy efficiency upgrade, you have various ways to finance it, to spread that cost out. And we have an example on the next page, I believe, of something that uh, we did for a Fortune 100 company. Um, they had uh, a series of distribution centers across the United States, and they said they're going to install energy efficiency equipment in these distribution centers to reduce the energy. And in this particular case, Citi worked with another partner where we provided debt to an SPV the other partner put an equity. Together, we bought and installed the energy efficiency equipment for this company. It was all installed. They signed an energy services uh, contract and an energy, an energy uh, as a service contract, EAAS. 
and the savings that they got on the contract were used, the savings on electricity were used to repay the debt. And for the in the first three years, it saved them about $10.7 million. Uh, it's worked quite well for saving energy. It's also reduced carbon dioxide. It works so well, they decided to expand and do it in more sites in the United States. And the key for their perspective was there was no upfront CapEx. It was all done off balance sheet because of the EAS structure and the ESCO guaranteed the performance. So we did one of these ourselves for a data center. Uh, we've done it for corporate clients. And the concept is they're all going to be custom tailored, but the concept is let's go in, spread that cost out, and then lend them money for this specific project separate from the regular corporate balance sheet. And in many cases, it can be off balance sheet, it can be non-recourse, different ways to do it but it's worked quite well in this situation. Um, if I go ahead uh, to the next section, let me just check the time here, okay. So um, another sector that we look at, at the other end of it, and we'll come back and talk more, uh, is the residential side. So again, if you have a 500 million or a billion dollar project, you can project finance it each project at a time. If you have homeowners like in America where people own their own houses, and they each want to do an energy efficiency upgrade. The problem we run into is that for residential projects, whether it's single family or even multifamily, everybody knows the homeowner wants to lower their electricity bill. Everybody wants to, but there's less products that work. The homeowners often don't have a budget to do this. They certainly don't have a strong credit, and it's very difficult for financial institutions to evaluate all these individual credits. So what's the solution? The solution is pool together. Don't look at one project of $50,000. Instead, it's a giant market in America. There are millions of homes and millions of buildings. So let's pool them together. Let's do it in 10,000 homes and pool them together. And then we can finance based on statistical analysis, the pool of credits and the law of large numbers. And that lends itself to securitization technology through the ABS market. So city as an example, will find specialty lenders, the people who actually lend to the individual mom and dad who own the house or who rent the house or who want to do the energy efficiency upgrade. There are specialty finance companies or regional players that know those individual homeowners. We don't, but they do. And what we say is, well, to us, for us to reach all those homeowners that we don't know, let's work with the specialty lenders. So specialty lender X has 10,000 homeowners that they're making lo loans to in, let's say, the state of Florida to do solar panels on their roofs and energy efficiency upgrades. And what we do is we tell that specialty lender that, well, we don't know all those 10,000 different people in Florida, but we can analyze the way you, the specialty lender, do your lending, how you underwrite your homeowners, and what the payment performance has been. Do people actually make good on their loans? So we do all that analysis and we come up with a framework. And the way we do these pools is we provide a warehouse lending facility to the specialty lender so they can start putting together this pool because the first 10 loans that go in may not be diversified. But by the time they have 10,000 loans in the pool and they're very well diversified, now we can look at statistical analysis. So we have a pool, we can securitize it and issue out asset-backed securities to finance long-term that pool of homeowners loans. Now, in America, we have the FICO scores. Different countries have different ways of doing this, but that's the system that we use in America so that we can look historically at correlation between a homeowner's FICO score and their payment history. And we can then make judgments using statistical analysis that for given these FICO scores, this is the payment performance we expect to see going forward. And because we've got 10,000 together, again, we can look, and it's 100,000 in some cases, we can look at statistical analysis to figure out what we can do. So we lend the money, build up the pool. And then once we've got the pool securitized, we'll have a senior piece and a junior piece and you do work analysis to convince yourself that with this amount of junior cushion, subordination, equity, whatever you want to call it, the senior securities can be rated 
uh, and get investment grade ratings, and we can sell that to institutional investors in the US and frankly around the world. So we've done many of these in the US with US-based specialty lenders. Um, and then what we do is we uh, are starting to see this happen in Europe. Haven't done, we haven't done it in Asia yet, but hopefully that will be coming before too long. And again, the model is the same warehouse to put together the diversified pool because diversification is critical and then use statistical analysis to figure out how we can look at the entire pool together so that has been successfully utilized um, we've done a number of them and going into these pools can be various types of energy efficiency upgrades but it's usually the things i mentioned uh, it can be uh, lighting it can be insulation but it can also be smart meters and more sophisticated things. And we have a couple of examples here of things that we've done. If we go to the next page, just to talk about one of these, um, there was an energy efficiency specialty company that we decided to finance this way. And they were in the business of installing and leasing to homeowners in the US and Canada, heating, cooling, and hot water systems, all of which reduce significantly the energy consumed by the typical homeowner. And we did the first ABS deal where all the assets in the pool were HVAC and uh, water heaters. And we did a big pool of individual loans and ended up issuing to the ASAPAC securitization market this $337 million financing, which took the short-term warehouse and then termed it out uh, for many years and gave them the permanent financing that they wanted. It was very, very successful. The all-in cost was just over 3%. Excellent timing on their part. Today, interest rates are obviously higher. But this was an example. After we had the warehouse, this then provided the term financing for that pool of loans. Uh, and we're doing the same sort of thing in other asset classes. But the com common denominator is pools of residential homeowners with FICO scores if you have a big enough pool with enough diversification, we can use statistical analysis, work with the rating agencies, get ratings. In this case, there was a single A, a triple B, and a double B tranche, uh, and place those with uh, institutional investors. Um, and that's how we got the $337 million done there. All done here in the United States. Um, if we go to the next page, just to comment on the last uh, part of the market, and I'm just checking here again, so it's it's, uh, it's on the 30 mark. Um, well, what about these small and medium scale projects? We've talked about what do you do when you have 500 million, we can do a big giant project financing. When you have 50,000, we can pull 10,000 of them together and do it as a poll. What do we do with everything in the middle? These, th this is still the biggest potential market. This sector desperately needs to lower their energy consumption, but it's still the most challenging to do. And it's still in process. There's been a little bit of progress, but nowhere near what we want. And hopefully over the next couple of years, we'll see a lot more because there is no clear solution. We do not have a single product that works for everybody. As we say here, we don't have the one size fits all solution because they're all different. And again, you know, what's the problem? Everybody knows they need to save on their energy bills. And in this sector, you've got uh, corporates and industrials that are smaller companies where they don't they don't need 500 million they need 5 million or 7 million or 11 million or 1.3 million well the problem is that projects that size are frankly too small to be financed by a large bank like city or the big institutional investors that we sell to on a one off basis you're not going to spend a year structuring a financing to raise $11 million. It's just too small. Um, but they're also too different to group together. They don't become homogeneous. It's very, very hard to do a pooled transaction where you can say, based on statistical analysis, law of large numbers, they're all homogeneous. So you can blend them all together and figure out how much cushion you need. Because now each individual asset is too bespoke, too unique. Um, you don't have FICO scores to look at them all like you can for residential pools. They usually lack investment grade ratings or they may not have ratings at all. So the individual credits are very, very hard to understand. 
and lack of standardized contracts is a big problem. So even if they do transactions with ESCOs and even if they're convinced they're going to save money, it's very hard to, as I said, we're, we're, we certainly at City are not going to spend a year putting together a transaction that's only $3 million in size. And it's very hard to put together a lot of these different things that look so different because they don't really add together. You can't average them. Again, no FICO scores, no credit ratings for Moody's or S&P. The individual credits, are they just take, it'll take too long to understand every one of them. And this lack of standardized contracts makes it really, really hard. So you can't say there's no correlation. You can't say that things are, are uh, individual. You oftentimes have what we call the tall tree problem, which is you have 20 deals that are three to 5 million, but then you throw in there a couple that are 20, 25, 40 million, and it's very hard to average them together. And when people in, in America ask me, like, why is this such a big problem? I also often give them the following example. I say, it, it's like, think of athletics for a moment and think of two different nations decide they're going to play a basketball game uh, against each national teams for basketball. And then they're also going to play, uh, whether you call it soccer or football, they're going to play a soccer match together. And in the basketball game, the, the final score is uh, one country scores 80, the other scores 70. But in the soccer game, the, the, the football, as you say in Europe, the score is four to two. Well, if you say the average of those, 80 to 70, four to two, uh, that you could say, well, the average score was 42 to 36. But that obviously doesn't mean anything. You can't average a soccer score with a basketball score because to say the average score was 42 to 36 is meaningless. That doesn't make sense for basketball. And it doesn't make sense for soccer. If, if there was a soccer match, a, a football match, where at the end of the day, it was 42 to 36, you'd say that's not possible. You can't score that many goals in a soccer game. So um, you can't. So that's the problem we run into with these medium-sized deals is you can't average them because they're too different. It's meaningless to try to do that. So to do this financing, we're st it's still work in progress. We're trying to figure out solutions that would allow us to fund these. And it could be that we say, well, for this particular type of transaction, we will have standardized documents and we will have standardized participants and we'll do a program of them. So we each one may only be five, uh, three to seven million, but we're going to do 20 of them. It's still a bit small, but it's enough size to try. Um, or we have to do a very large pool, which has to have standardized contracts so we can start to say that there are some common denominators amongst the credit performance and how will people uh, repay it. So a pool or a program is probably the best way to do it. The best way to make this work uh, is to group them and fund them like we do at a residential warehouse. But to make that make sense, you've got to have the standardization, not just around the contracts, but around the measurement and the verification. We've also got to think about for every single country where we do this, uh, are there different legal stru structures and local laws that allow for us to do this? That's our problem in Europe right now. It's very hard to put in the same pool a project in Italy and one in France and one in Germany and one in England, because they all have different rules and different laws. I suspect that'll be an even bigger problem in Asia. I don't know that we could ever put Australia, uh, Australia could do a deal just in Australia, but if we want to put Australia and Indonesia and Malaysia uh, and Korea and, and, and you know India together, I, I don't know how that's going to work. Um, so we've got to think about how do we get that type of standardization? How do we understand the, the natural uh, the national legal structures in each country and the ability to underwrite and determine the credit of the parties involved. Now, clearly, history shows with normal project finance, the way to solve this is to get credit insurance, some kind of a wrap. However, we don't know that that's available yet, and it's a spulk and it's expensive. Or we have to think through ways to de-risk in each country by having some type of country-specific support that would allow the growth of the private transaction market. And that typically involves governments and other support. But basically, we have to have people in each country who understand the credit risk. The people who understand the risk best are usually the best ones to take the risk. Once it's the risk, we can find ways to pull it together. But that's going to be the challenge. And maybe in certain countries, there are national groups that can de-risk the projects. And we, if we can make that happen, 
it's going to take a while and the benefits may not pay off immediately, but financial institutions need to keep working on this and with the developers and with people who could de-risk projects, because over the long term, this is going to be critical. We're not going to always have big, giant investment grade corporations. We need new products and new solutions to make this work. But again, these are financial projects, uh, financial products. And financial products historically are very, very hard to do in isolation. It's not like inventing a new semiconductor where you can come up with a great project and a product in a laboratory and just mass market to everybody here. With financial products, we need to really understand how will the energy efficiency upgrades be made? How will they be installed? How will they be used? Before we know that, it's very, very hard to finance them. So we have to really make sure that we understand it. And I, and I have a, to be silly, I have a favorite example that I show where I say, here's the problem. If you have very smart people in the laboratory working on a new financial product, but they don't really understand how clients are going to use the product, you don't get good results. So if you switch to the next slide for a second, this is the example I typically give. We had some very smart people in the laboratory and we said, what we want you to build is a swing. And for those of you who have children, you know what it's like where you, you build a swing, you put your child on the swing, you pull back, you let go and they smile and they're happy and they're swinging back and forth. And the picture on the left was what we wanted and it makes lots of sense. But the problem was the people in the laboratory were very smart, but they were young and they didn't have any children yet. So they designed the swing on the right. Now, anyone who's ever done this with their son or daughter knows that if you put them on the swing and you pull back and let go, on the left, they're gonna be happy. On the right, they're gonna be crying and very unhappy. And again, not everybody understands this because if you don't have children, you've never done this. You could easily come up with the picture on the right, not the picture on the left. So in this particular case, we explained to this group of laboratory uh, geniuses uh, at what we really wanted and why that picture on the right wasn't going to work. But again, unless they understand what we're trying to accomplish, they may spend weeks and months devising something that you'll look at and you'll laugh at and you'll say, are you kidding me? Is that really what they came up with? So we asked them to come up in this example with a solution and what they designed is on the next page, which, you know, was this a useful solution? I would say that's not the ideal way to solve the problem. What we should have gone back to was the picture on the left. So I can't hear if anybody is, I can't see if you're smiling or if you understand the joke, but the point is that if you don't understand how the product will be used, even after extensive modeling and analysis and documentation and legal work, you could end up with this picture when there's a much easier way to do the same thing. So that's the difference between financial structures and other new products where you just can't develop them in the laboratory. You have to spend time with the investors, with the issuers, with the regulators and understand what you're allowed to do and what the best way is to do it. So again, we believe that energy efficiency is critical. City is committed to being a green bank. We believe energy transition and energy efficiency are very, very important. I don't think we can get where we need to be purely by building new clean energy. We have to find ways to reduce energy consumption. Energy efficiency is the best way to do that. And I think I should pause here and give uh, Susanna the chance to, uh, she's got some questions and she may have some other comments that she wants to go to. Right, thank you, Marshall. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. Now we have a few pre-registration questions from the audience. Um, I'll read them out for you. Question one is, what are the mechanisms that city has in place to ensure data transparency in energy efficiency? That's a very interesting question. Now, the reality is that data transparency is not really specific to energy efficiency. But what I would say is that most of the transactions we do, we do a lot through this thing called energy, uh, energy service companies, the ESCOs, uh, in, in our energy as a service, EAS deals. The ESCO is performing the operations and maintenance during the life of the transaction 
and they will also include annual measurement and verifications. So most of our transactions have explicit arrangements agreed to in advance by independent engineers and by the client and by the service provider where they're going to measure the savings. And it's typically outlined specifically in the service agreement and the O&M agreement. Some developers will also include metering systems along with the, the assets. So they're getting real-time feedback. But again, that means that day one, everything's been agreed to. So we have the degree of efficiency and transparency that all the parties have agreed to. So in that regard, it works well. And I think that's in general how the market should work. Um, people have the right to want transparency. And if you're going to do a transaction where you're measuring savings, that data will exist because that's how you figure out what the payments are that are going back and forth. Um, so that's that's one that I think uh, I think the the whole market should behave that way. All right, thank you. Moving on to the second question, considering the concerns on greenwashing, what are the ways in which banks can help to eliminate greenwashing risk? Ah, good question. So greenwashing is uh, the enemy of the of the clean energy and energy efficiency world. And greenwashing can be done by uh, project developers or, or corporations who are, who are issuing securities or getting people to invest in their projects if they misrepresent what they are. Uh, but it can also be done on the investor side when a, a fund manager might tell people, give me your money, I'm going to invest it all in green projects, but they don't really follow through on that. Um, now, again, this is not specific to energy efficiency. In fact, it's probably more relevant for new build clean energy than it is for energy efficiency. Um, but what I would say is in the, whether it's energy efficiency or if it's, uh, if it's new build clean energy, when you look at how the sponsor is raising the money for the project, the bulk of the bird burden is on that sponsor to disclose exactly what they're doing. So at City, if somebody wants to do a green bond, we have a committee that reviews the language and the, and the explanation that the issuer is using. When they say, this is green, we ask questions because we want to make sure, are we comfortable putting our name on that piece of paper? But ultimately, we can't uh, we can't insist what language goes into the documents that describe the transaction. The issuer has to do that. And we encourage them to be as transparent as possible and to make it absolutely clear that this is not greenwashing. But we ultimately, if we saw a transaction where it did not look like the proceeds were really being used for green purposes, but the issuer was claiming they were, we would have to not participate. We'd have to either ask them to change what they're doing or not participate in the transaction, but it's up to the company XYZ or government XYZ if they're to, to, ex, to explain what they're going to use the money for. Now, where this gets particularly tricky is uh, when you follow the green bond principles, they didn't in the beginning require that you have third party uh, independent sources verifying everything because different people have different definitions of green. So the whole industry needs to do more work on this. But I think right now everyone agrees greenwashing is bad. People should not claim it's green if it isn't, uh, but it's going to still evolve a bit. Regulators are getting involved in America and around the world, uh, in, in Europe and, and in, and in uh, North America. Um, I'm not as up to speed on the latest developments in Asia, but this is clearly something that we all care about. People should not be raising money and telling their people that telling their investors that it's going to go to green if it's not going to go to green. Or again, sometimes the definitions are not precise. And the best way is to be very precise in what you're doing and then let the investor decide whether they deem it to be green or not. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the safest way to do it. And um, again, there'll be more guidance coming out on this, but we're big believers in uh, whatever we can do to prevent greenwashing. We want to do that. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of the person raising the money to disclose exactly what they're doing. And you know what? We're finding a lot of investors in America, at least, and Europe and Asia, some of the ones we know in Asia, they're not 
just relying on a third party to tell them is it green or not. They, they've got their own rules that they're following. They ask their own questions and they want to be comfortable on their own. Um, so we'll see how that all develops. Right, thank you. Um, the next question, could green retrofit potentially be a solution to accelerate the transition to clean energy? So as we went through early on in this presentation, uh, we've highlighted the answer is clearly yes. It's not necessarily the entire solution, but it's definitely gonna be part of the overall solution because we need all these different things together to make this work. And again, if you build new clean energy and then use energy efficiency to reduce energy consumption, the two together is obviously the best way to do it. And if you can pair energy efficiency with the development of new clean energy and at the same time retire fossil fuel plants, then you really get to net zero much quicker. So in the ideal world, you, you, you'd build 100 megawatts of clean energy, you'd reduce 100 megawatts through energy efficiency, uh, and then you'd retire 100 megawatts of coal and you'd have a $300 million impact uh, or 300 megawatt impact. So that would be the ideal way to do it. Um, we tend to tell people when they ask us about clean energy, we often get asked, well, what's the best way to do this? Should I do wind? Should I do solar? Should I do biofuels? Should I do geothermal? Should I do hydrogen? And we like to say that today, the world needs an all of the above uh, from like a multiple choice exam when you were in college, all of the above, meaning it's A, B, C, D, and E, you need to do all of those to hit your targets. And we would include energy efficiency in the all of the above strategy, because we shouldn't be picking winners. We should be trying to do all of these things. And depending on the region, depending on the geography, the geology, the resources, the, how, how the wind blows, how sunny it is, the temperature, do they have access to different raw materials? There are going to be different solutions all over the world. And they can be, even in America, from one state to another, certain things make sense. We're not going to build a big giant wind farm in Manhattan, in New York City, where I am. You're going to do that in the Midwest, where you have the plains and lots of flat land with farms. Um, it, you can't put a lot of solar if you live in a valley surrounded by mountains where you don't get direct sunlight. So you, you, you have to build geothermal where you have the geothermal heat. So depending on where you are, it very much dictates what you're going to do. But all of these together, including energy efficiency, is the best way to do it. I see. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question. What do you think is the major challenge of improving energy efficiency around the world? Well, it, the dilemma, as we said, is that most corporates, uh, the, the agencies, the governments, the homeowners, everybody is worried about this earnings impact. It's the problem of, I know I should spend the million dollars to save 250 a year for 20 years. I know I should do that. But in year one, I only get 250 of savings and I spent the million. So I have 750 negative. And that's a big, big problem for all the people in business because they want to find a way to do this that's earnings positive immediately. They don't want to have to explain to people it's going to take 20 years to get the savings or the payback in that case, maybe five or 10 years before they get them. Well, in that particular case, it'd be four years before they get the money back. So um, people like to see earnings impact right away in the first year. Um, I'm just looking, I'm just thinking through. Um, it's, there are certain sectors um, where energy efficiency upgrades are really important but it's very, very hard to understand the underlying credits. And that's why we said uh, you need a measure. For the big giant projects, it's credit ratings. Because if the project performs, I'll get paid back. If I lend money, project performs, I get, lend, I get paid back. Even if the project doesn't perform, either the ESCO or the corporate will still pay me back because they're a good credit. Now, the problem with the big company, big project, is that if the company goes bankrupt, they can't pay. Whether the upgrade worked or not doesn't matter. They went bankrupt. They don't have the money. They can't pay me. They were going to save a lot of money on their electricity bill, but they're out of business, so they can't pay me. We can take that risk because we understand corporate credit, and we can say, 
this single A-rated company, it's so unlikely to go out of business. I'm not going to really worry about that situation. They're single A. They're going to pay me back. Now it's just if the project works, I get my money because they're not going to go bankrupt. And when I look at individuals, a homeowner, you have the same question. If a homeowner installs energy efficiency upgrades and they're working, that's great. And they'll pay me back. Uh, and if they're not working, somebody else kicks in the money and I get paid back. However, what happens if the man and the woman that own the house together, what if they both get, uh, they both lose their jobs? The projects, the installate, the things they install in their house are working perfectly. The energy bill, the energy consumption is down. The energy usage is down. Uh, their bi the electric bill is down, but they both lost their jobs. They don't have any money to pay me back. So I have to take into account the credit of the homeowners Will they pay me whether the project works or not? I need to know that I'm going to get my money back. And that's the problem in that middle sector where it's so hard to understand all of the credits that even if the project works, hopefully I get paid. But if the project doesn't work, I don't know if I'll ever get the money back. And if the project works and I should be getting my money back, that's what that 90% of the time I expect the project to work and I'm going to get my money back or at least 90% of the time. That looks like a great risk. But then that little company that I don't know, again, goes bankrupt or they run into a liquidity problem. So even though the project's working and they're reducing their energy consumption and they're saving money on the electric bill, they can't use the savings to pay me back because they went out of business. So again, I don't get my money. And this is particularly difficult when they're small and medium-sized companies where we don't really understand the credit. We have to look to people in the region that do. And it's also a big, big problem in real estate because if you have a, a, a big commercial office building, there may be many, many different tenants and they have different leases and we don't know who they are. And, and the credits get all confusing again, because oftentimes the landlord, their only ability to pay us back is based on them getting the rents in the building. And sometimes the landlords are shell companies or, the, or they're legal entities that are very, very hard to understand the credit of. So we need to be able to do the credit work uh, to for that middle side. And that's one of the things that we really have to work on is how do we get to the understand the underlying credit and what do we do when the credit is weak? And then lastly, we'd say when these projects are too small, as I said, we're not going to spend months and months and months on a $3 million project. So we have to figure out ways to pull together and credit enhance these smaller projects to reach the right scale. And that gets back to then lastly, as I said, standardization of contracts. All of those together are the major challenges to improve energy efficiency around the world. Right. And was, there, was there one more or is that it? That's it. So thank you, Marshall, for such an engaging and insightful sharing. With that, we have also come to the end of today's session. Um, thank you for your participation in the Alliance event. Please take a moment to complete a satisfaction survey to help us deliver more relevant content, as well as create a more seamless experience. You can find the QR code on the screen. Your responses and personal data collected in the survey are confidential and will only be assessed by the Alliance. We will not share the information with any third parties. If you haven't subscribed to the Alliance newsletter, we would also like to encourage you to sign up to receive our latest announcements, webinar and training invitations, and reports and stay on top of the shifting global green finance market. Once again, the Alliance hopes today's event inspires ideas and discussions around the ways that we can make our city more sustainable and the world a better place. See you in our next event. Goodbye. Thank you, Marshall. Bye-bye. Thank you.